Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I feel like I should respond as a, because Gilberto set up this really fun competition and also named me as sort of a stand-in for Matt Hansen, which is something I could never be. And so I reject that premise. But also furthermore, I don't think it's really in my nature to think about this competitively. Uh, when I started my job at the World Resources Institute, they made us take like a personality test. I don't know if you've taken these kinds of personality tests that categorize you as one kind of person or another, but I, I was named as a connector. And I, I think that that's what I do a lot in my job is I, I end up connecting people. Um, and I think we work together. So hopefully you'll be surprised in some of the things that I present today that we are not, um, we're working with a big diversity of partners. And I hope you'll also find a lot of really nice and appropriate uses for, for these kinds of global maps as well um, in some of the examples that I'll give. And I'm, I'm trying to focus on sort of like the impact part of this data to, to impact that, um, that we work on. So I work uh, for the World Resources Institute in, in the Land and Carbon Lab. So the Land and Carbon Lab is a data innovation and monitoring platform. Um, we are monitoring not just forests, but all land cover types. Um, I want to see. We'll to use this as well. Okay, this will be easier for me because then I can see my notes and make sure I, I hit all my major talking points. Okay, so the Land and Carbon Lab is harnessing breakthroughs in geospatial monitoring to help governments, businesses, and communities deploy solutions for sustainable landscapes on the ground. Okay, so I haven't actually been at Land and Carbon Lab for that long, a little more than two years. So before that, I was an academic. I was writing research papers and doing fun things like this field work here. I'm taking forest inventories at Luquillo Long-Term Ecological Research Station in Puerto Rico. Um, and I really enjoyed being in academia, but it was something, sometimes it was hard for me to see directly the connections between the work that I was doing and the difference that it was making to anyone. So now my role, at Land and Carbon Lab looks a little bit different. We're not only interested in generating new data and research, but we're working on a diverse, uh, with a diverse group of partners to turn the data into impact by connecting cutting edge land use monitoring, like many of the projects that you all are working on here, with those on the front lines of um, land use decisions. So at the opening of the conference, Julia Wagaman gave a really nice overview of the timeline of openly available remote sensing products. And I would add that over the last decade, we've also seen a huge potential for what these products can do to help us, um, to help us guide decisions and um, has already led to positive impacts for a more resilient, sustainable future for people, nature, and climate. Um, and I'm gonna start giving some examples for changes that have already happened in related to forest monitoring. So we knew that deforestation was a big problem before there was any remote sensing based monitoring, but um, it's hard to monitor such vast uh, and remote natural resources. And so it's really difficult to act on. Um, so there's a good reason we asked this question when a tree falls and no one is there to hear it, or post their status on social media, does it make a sound? So um, obviously you want to stop illegal deforestation. And if you want to do that, you need to know where it's happening and when it's happening. And so almost 10 years ago um, at the World Resources Institute, we were bringing together scientists from leading universities and tech companies to figure out how to elevate and scale up forest monitoring products. And it wasn't an easy task from what I understand. Like I said, I wasn't there 10 years ago, um, but they worked with Google and the University of Maryland to bring together the latest advances in technology like remote sensing, cloud computing and artificial intelligence um, to create the world's first global scale near real-time forest monitoring platform in Global Forest Watch. So now anyone with an internet connection can go online, zoom in anywhere in the world and see where and when deforestation is happening with uh, this kind of level of granularity. So what you see here are logging roads snaking into the national park buffer zone in Peru. Now, when a tree falls in the Amazon and it shows up as a pink pixel um, as an alert system on Global Forest Watch Map. And um, maybe you've subscribed to some alerts 
for a certain area and you can receive email alerts and navigate to these places in the field using your mobile tools offline and check out what's going on. So this is what deforestation looks like when it's driven by industrial scale palm oil expansion in Papua New Guinea. And it's important to keep in mind that um, tree cover loss alert system on its own does not address deforestation. It's the people that are doing um, the action. So this is Betty Padilla, her community of about 40 families in the Peruvian Amazon have collective title to about 20,000 hectares of pristine Amazon rainforest. Their forest is threatened by miners and farmers encroaching from nearby towns. So using Global Forest Watch's deforestation alerts, Betty and her team are able to work with local law enforcement to identify and stop illegal deforestation before it spreads. And dozens of communities like, the, like Betty's across the Amazon are using Global Forest Watch to conduct thousands of patrols. Another story, an inter-American development bank had just started using Global Forest Watch when they received a fire alert on a client's cattle farm 250 kilometers away. They notified their client and received a thank you a few days later. The rancher lost 100 hectares of pasture but saved the rest of his 1,200 hectare property and his herd because he was able to stop the fire before it spread. So thanks to Global Forest Watch, the bank is not only protecting their investments, but also adding more value to their clients. And in the Congo Basin, a logging company noticed unauthorized deforestation alerts in a concession that borders Odelza National Park. They reached out to the Ministry of Land Use Planning, where a new GIS department uh, staff used Global Forest Watch tools to conduct a national review of concessions. They could do this because the tools allow governments to easily overlay contextual information with near real-time data. They revoked eight mining permits based on what they found and continue to use Global Forest Watch tools for better land management. And at least 11 other national governments have adopted the tools and use them in a similar way. So hopefully Gilberto will agree that this is maybe an appropriate use of global forest monitoring maps. Okay, so over the past 10 years, we've collected hundreds of stories like these from around the world. Um, and these are only the stories that we know about because someone took the time or they're involved, we're involved with a partnership where they wrote back to us a thank you email or approached us in a meeting to tell us their story. Which brings me to one of the things that I wanted to um, suggest to this group today, <laughs> which is that you too should be tracking your user stories so there are a lot of good reasons to be tracking your user stories. It communicates your value, funders like to see it, and if you are like me, you might find bringing your own work closer to impact really meaningful and motivating. It's also an important aspect of monitoring your success. So luckily for many of the people in this room, Open Earth Monitor is already built on these use cases, so you have a really solid head start for all of the great things that your project will manifest. So these stories are just the tip of an iceberg that includes over 6.7 million unique visitors to Global Forest Watch over the past 10 years. And these people are using Global Forest Watch's deforestation alerts to collectively monitor 91 million hectares of forest. Okay, so the previous director of Global Forest Watch, Crystal Davis, frequently refers to this Gartner hype cycle as a way to explain the maturation process for new technologies. So for Global Forest Watch, it started with a technology trigger, like the convergence of satellite imagery, cloud computing, which gave us um, compelling vision, but unfounded strategies. So we went up then to the peak of inflated expectations. Um, there were ministers and CEOs making statements about Global Forest Watch, which could do, uh, and, and things that Global Forest Watch could do before uh, they really know, knew how they were going to do any of that. So um, naturally, the only way to go from this peak is down. And in 2016, 2017, Global Forest Watch was descended into what they call the trough of disillusionment. So in the pursuit of quick outcomes, they had spread the team very thin and lost focus on strengths, but there was still a constant stream of stories and outcomes coming from partners and users. And through those stories, they developed a better understanding of who the target users really are and how they should be improving their system. 
Um, so now I think maybe they're on this slope of enlightenment, getting ready, you know, uh, they've done some work to sort of scale things and maybe eventually we'll make it to this plateau of productivity where maybe they'll talk to Gilberto and go back to the trough of disillusionment for a while, I don't know. That was a bit of a retrospective history about Global Forest Watch and the process of making change with forest monitoring data. But now I'm gonna move on to like a more forward looking part of the talk. So we can imagine what could be possible if we took the advances that we have in monitoring forests and started to expand on them to not only cover forests, um, but to cover all land types. And then if on top of that, we could also measure carbon emissions and removals associated with each of these, car these land cover types. So we'd be able to not just see deforestation, but conversion from natural ecosystems and understand what's driving the conversion. We could see not only where trees are falling, but where trees are growing inside and outside of forests and how this is contributing to global restoration targets. And we'd be able to see where we can create more sustainable and resilient food systems and where land should be conserved and protected. On top of that, we'd be able to monitor emissions from land use change, and we'd be able to see where interventions are needed and where to achieve, uh, where interventions are needed to achieve this decade's sustainable development, biodiversity, and climate goals. And so this is what Land and Carbon Lab is attempting to do. So it's the same team that developed Global Forest Watch. We're now expanded, um, and we're working on geospatial data and monitoring innovations across a whole range of land uses under the Land and Carbon Lab. So Land and Carbon Lab has projects to develop monitoring in many different land covers and land uses, but I can start with this project that I'm coordinating on some notoriously difficult to map areas, rangelands, grasslands, and pastures. Um, they cover a majority of the world. Um, they're critical for food production, biodiversity and ecosystem services, and human well-being. Um, and these areas are critically important if we want to understand the global land squeeze and to guide land use planning. And we're not gonna hit our climate goals unless we start to better manage these areas as well. So it turns out that there was no existing suitable project targeting these areas specifically. There was nothing we could just turn into those pink pixels that you saw for tree cover loss, for, but for pastures. So to work on innovating new data for these important working lands, we formed a research consortium with some great partners we're calling it Global Forest Watch or Global Pasture Watch. You'll recognize many of the um, consortium members as people that are here today. So the GLAD Lab is involved. They provided this analysis ready Landsat data and Leandro presented how he's um, making that data much more usable, downscaling it, um, gap filling it. Uh, and we're working with Mario Herrero at Cornell. He's doing some livestock emissions work that I'm not gonna talk about today. That's just getting started. Um, we're working with the LAPIC team at the University of Goiás in Brazil. They're doing, they've, they did, you know, the pasture mapping for map biomes. And so they bring a lot of knowledge about how to map the world's pastures and um, are helping on many elements of this project. And Stefan Fritz, is, who is here, his, his group along with IDEV, they're helping with our livestock density mapping. And of course, um, Open Geo Hub is um, sort of leading the technical aspects of the project. So broadly, we're producing an annual time series of maps starting in the year 2000 to present based on these um, Landsat data, mostly at 30 meter spatial resolution. And the maps will tell us about grassland extended management, pasture condition and productivity, and livestock density and methane emissions. So we're taking the approach of creating flexible data products with per pixel probabilities and uncertainties that with some effort we believe will serve a diversity of use cases, such as understanding the global land squeeze, monitoring conversion-free compliance, restoration planning, land sector greenhouse gas accounting, improving livestock production models, and improving grazing land management. And I'm really excited for the future once we have these data out. Uh, when people email me and tell me their own, how they're using these data in really new and creative ways that we never thought of before that aren't on this list. So I wanna quickly walk you through some of the data products that we are developing. Um, there's four major products here and one integrated map as well. So 
To make these deliverables possible, we're working with many Earth observation and satellite data, multiple sources of reference samples for pasture areas, including visual interpretation and in-situ data, and we're relying on machine learning um, workflow and framework. So first, we have this pasture class map that separates out seeded or planted pastures from natural and semi-natural grasslands. It's an annual time series at 30 meters resolution starting in the year 2000. And here we separate the, these planted grasses from natural and semi-natural areas. And this requires global visual, a global visual inspection campaign that's being carried out by our partners at the Lab Pig Group at the University of Goyas. They have dozens of interpreters and several supervisors inspecting thousands of tiles all over the world. They've made available already their QGIS plugin that they've developed for the project. It's called Fast Grid Inspection, and you can find it along with the documentation at the link below if you're interested. It's adaptable to other projects as well. And we have some early grassland class maps in the continental US and Brazil and um, in Europe. And we'll be improving on these before our first global collection. So here you can see the planted versus natural and semi-natural grasslands in the US. And then the per pixel uncertainties, that rainbow color that flashes on top. Next, we're working on global one kilometer maps of livestock density. These maps have census and survey data as inputs and rely on downscaling from these admin level um, to, the, to the grid cell level. And we plan to use a consistent modeling approach across time so that the data can be used in a time series. We currently don't have good livestock density um, long time series. So I think this will be a useful product. We've built this modeling workflow and have a database and pipeline set up for the census and survey data. And we will continue to be collecting that throughout the course of the project. And Leandro is now testing out various ways to downscale um, to a gridded product. And next, um, we're working on this vegetation height and structure. So height between maybe like three and five meters. And this is coming from ISAT2 LIDAR. So postdoc Maria Hunter in the LAPIG group is currently leading an effort in the Cerrado to work out the methods and conduct field work to calibrate the methods. And we're hoping the results of the work will allow us to estimate something like the fraction of woody vegetation um, in these systems and also scale up. Um, and lastly, we're working on this global bi-monthly 30 meter GPP time series. Um, we can use this to define where we've got low or high productivity areas. The product is based on a light use efficiency model similar to the MODIS GPP product. Um, and what's driving the resolution here is really that Landsat analysis ready data. So it depends sort of, the success sort of depends heavily on um, the work that Leandro has done to aggregate it and remove clouds and um, gap fill it. And we found so far that the estimates are performing pretty well at flux sites. The, result, uh, the results here are the work of Julia Hacklander with Open Hub. She presented her new and really exciting work on FPAR yesterday, you might've seen it. Um, and we think the time series will help us to indicate trends in the condition of grasslands and pastures. So the data are currently part of an open earth monitor use case as an input to like a degradation monitor that would allow people to use it for like regional scale degradation assessments, um, which I think makes more sense than trying to come up with some global scale degradation assessment. And we'll make available all of the input data we prepared and harmonized the machine learning models and also the source code. And so everything here should be fully reproducible. So I hope that when Julia Wagman conducts a new survey about reproducibility, we will pull up that group average and she'll like give us a gold star for reproducibility. So for all of these products, we intend to release them in global collections. We want to engage user communities and have a feedback loop where we release improved versions over time. And so we should have beta versions of many of our first global products for testing as early as the end of this year. And we're, we will also make an integrated map where we combine and threshold the grass class, livestock density, and vegetation height to get combined classes that will be able to tell us something not just about where grassland is as a land cover, but where pasture and um, where pastures are as a managed land use and where, the grazing, where there's grazing on grasslands versus grazing on or browsing in shrublands as well. 
And the project, I don't think, will be successful unless we really engage with people. So we're looking for people with local knowledge about their landscapes, for ground data to validate the products, and for people to test out beta versions of the products and give us feedback. And in return, we're making everything open, doing capacity building and running workshops and webinars. Okay, so now at this point, I'd like to open a Slido, um, selfishly because I'm quite interested in learning about how people will be using this product. So if you could switch to the Slido screen. Um, if it works. Okay. Does, is the number up there? Yeah, three, three, zero, five, 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 seven. I don't know if you need to click that present button. So it's just a word cloud. I'm just curious to like, to learn about all of the different things that people would, would if you had any of these products, I'm curious how you would use them. One person is typing. Maybe no one, okay, here we go. to start a business. Okay, so we have an open data license, but I think it what does allow for commercial uses of the products. Understanding global trends, yeah. So I think that's a big part of it. We started in the year 2000, um, in part because um, we wanted to sort of target, um, like WRI leads this greenhouse gas protocol. They have this land sector guidance, and usually they want 20 years change. So that's why we use this land set as a target. Checking, checking natural, national statistics. This is a good point because people don't usually use this kind of thing for reporting national statistics. They usually use their own country maps and then, and then they check them with some independent source to just see if they're missing anything. Greenhouse gas estimates, overgrazing. We're gonna look at this. Change over time. Climate smart land use. Yeah, like management. Integration with other data. I think we'll be set up to do that. To inform policy processes, mm, okay. Anthropic pressures, yeah. Okay, input for tree planting, this is good. I do think, so we have a restoration team at WRI and um, this team is very interested in where they, and the restoration team is a forest restoration team. So they're very interested in making sure that they avoid planting new tree planting campaigns on valuable natural grasslands. So that's how this team would like to use the data as well. Carbon studies, policy, um, comparing to local products. I also, if you, if you, well, I'll get to that in the next, in the next slide. Okay, great. I, if I get a, if I get a screenshot at the end, I can just put it on Mattermost and you guys can see, you can keep responding and I'll put the final thing up there. Okay, so if you were interested in say, for example, using these to compare to your own local products, we would love to hear from you. Or if there are other ways you'd like to be involved, um, I have a QR code up here, but I can also put the survey link in Mattermost as well. And if you're watching this online at some point in the future, you can still use the survey and we'd like to hear from you. Um, and I think if you fill out the survey, it'll give you the option to sign up for our mailing list and we'll have periodic newsletters for updates and you can indicate if you would like to be a beta tester for our initial um, products. It's a very, this group has a very transparent mindset. Probably if you work with Tom, you uh, have to believe in democracy and transparency, I think. Okay, so there was, in a carbon lab works, so I'm working on these global pastures and grasslands, but we have, project teams working on a bunch of different land cover products and I don't have time to cover them. And in fact, I think I'm, I should be almost done, but I just wanted to highlight this one because I think people in the room might be interested to know that it exists. Um, so it's these uh, land vegetation disturbance alerts created by the Cloud Lab at the University of Maryland. So it's from a hybrid Landsat Sentinel-2 provisional product. 
Um, it gives observations of disturbance every two to four days at 30 meters spatial resolution across all land cover types. And the vegetation disturbance, so if you wanna know how it works a little bit, is detected when there is an, an, a decrease in vegetation cover within an HLS pixel for um, plus or minus 15 days compared to the previous um, three years. And so it'll give flags with different sort of intensity for how um, confident we are in this. And now I regret choosing this as an example, but here's the conversion of the Cerrado vegetation to soy um, in Brazil. So I think that there are, because I think that there are a ton of really interesting uses for this all land disturbance alert. And also if you have creative ideas for how to use it, you should come talk to us because I think there's a lot of potential there and um, everyone in this room is very smart. Okay, so this is very boring, but I also wanted to just make you aware if you're interested in like the diversity of projects we have going on. So I won't just read verbatim, I have two slides that look just like this, but I can post the slides and you can follow up with me if you're interested. But generally we're looking at land cover change, greenhouse gas maps, a natural lands map, drivers of tree cover loss, carbon removal estimates, 10 meter trees outside of forests, carbon stocks and restoration landscapes, land use change emissions, management emissions, global crop yield and area maps. Um, I'll let you read about those later. And since the topic of this talk is about data for impact, I do want to share that one part of the strategy will be to make all of our data available through an API and develop apps for specific users and use cases, or else make partnerships with the people and organizations that are making these kinds of apps right now and serving our data to them easily. So if you are one of those people developing a targeted app that could take advantage of the land monitoring data that we're developing, you should please get in touch. Um, oops, just do everything. So there have been major breakthroughs in monitoring not only forests, but land use more broadly. Um, there are new sensors and technologies being attached to satellites every day, and we're just figuring out what we should do with them. So I think there are a lot of challenges ahead. It was mentioned in the discussion of our opening keynotes that just the incredible uh, vast amounts of data that we're getting, and not just like more data, but more frequent data, and that's its own sort of problem in itself. But another problem is the task of translating that data into actionable information. So the Land and Carbon Lab's vision for the future is not just an open data platform, but the synthesis of insights for practitioners. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. We're partnering with countless organizations, companies, and governments to help us make sure those technologies are applied for a better future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Do we have any questions, comments, feedback, or suggestions? Questions? Alex, please. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. I have just a quick comment to this second last slide regarding the APIs. Uh, just make sure to not reinvent the wheel there and really check uh, what's going on in the current uh, domain with, with standards and so on. So that we do not have, as also Peter put it this in presentation, the 11th or 12th new API and, and see that we convert on things like stack that most people now use um, when setting up the catalogs. On, it's just a very small comment and hope for the future that we don't need to even more standardize new things. No, it's good. It's a good comment. I think we have uh, we've developed this thing called the Data Lab at WRI, and they're involved. They're currently developing this system, so it's a good time to make those sort of decisions. Thanks. If you have some, if you have some specific thing, Alex, you can post on MetaMost, please. Alex, if you have something specific, some documents, just post on MetaMost so we get. More questions? Thanks.